So if you go to uh, Asda store, next to the price tag, they have it's cheaper than Tesco or it's cheaper than Sainsbury's. Or if you go to John Lewis, they tell you we will match the Amazon price if you buy if you buy from us, kind of thing. Even if the price is let's say on, on in John Lewis is 50 pounds, and then Amazon price is 40 pounds, they reduce the price to 40 to entice you to buy the product. So this is possible in one of the market structures, and this is oligopoly, and the process of price matching is called collusion or in this case, tacit collusion. Competition in oligopoly is between two large firms usually, two or three. I shouldn't say two because it's duopoly, but oligopoly is between few large firms. When the firms in the market increase, it's not oligopoly anymore because cooperation, coordination is, is not possible in the market where there are too many firms. So key features of oligopoly, there are few sellers, they are either offering similar products or uh, identical or differentiated as well. It, it, could be, it could be any type, depending on how cooperative the business is. Um, you can look at the oligopoly cases such, such as um, oil business, crude oil business. There aren't many oil supplies in the world, but the products are more or less the same, identical. Yeah? But you can also look at other businesses, large firms, um, mobile phone suppliers. They're, they have different dimensions, basically. It's hard to say whether they are monopolistically competitive or oligopoly, but if, they are, if you think of them oligopoly, their products are, well, they for provide uh, mobile phones, right? But then these are differentiated. Some have large screens, some have uh, high megapixels cameras, some have high capacity batteries, so this is a differentiation of oligopoly's products, yeah? And there's always interdependence between the firms. In other words, one's decision affects the other's actions, basically. The behaviors are connected. One reduces the price, the other then follows as well. Or maybe not. It, it really depends on the case. However, for oligopolists to achieve the better outcome in the market is to cooperate if they would like to keep the prices above the marginal cost. And there is also one feature of oligopolies that is similar to monopolistically competitive case is the non-price competition. It could be adverts, packaging, product design, they compete. They compete with each other. So non-price competition can be in different forms in many different ways and it could also be uh, attributable to a monopolistic competitive case as well. So they could have different open, so may, you may have uh, number of firms in a business, uh, in, in an industry providing similar products, but they may have different opening hours. So that's how they differentiate between them. In certain towns, you have a large Tesco, large Asda. One of them at least stays open for 24 hours. The super stores, yeah? So that's how they differentiate. Even if they are not selling at midnight or at 3 a.m. in the morning, they still leave it open, just to differentiate from others. Sponsorships. You may see Adidas logo on football players' kits. Yeah, so there's these oligopoly companies, Adidas, sportswear companies, oligopoly. There are not many of them. Of course, you're not comparing Adidas with uh, a cheap brand. There are plenty of uh, sports gear firms, but these dominant uh, companies, Reebok, Adidas, and some others are mostly oligopolists. So this is a list of non-price competition that you could think of. By the way, non-price competition could take many forms, so it's not an exhaustive list. Now, we mentioned earlier that oligopolists don't let new entrants. They tend to restrict entry of new firms. There are different ways of doing that. Incumbent oligopolies could have economies of scale. So these 10 firms, for example, in the market may be too large to compete with for a new entrant. They could be pricing at lowest price possible of their products. But the new entrants will think twice before entering them because you know, they won't want to sell at lower prices than what their costs justify. Also, there could possibly be limit pricing. Limit pricing could go a long time to keep the competitors away. Or they could control all the channels of distribution, for example, for these oligopolists. They may control it and they may not let other new entrants to control them or access them at all. And brand proliferation, for example. Plenty of brands of a single company providing detergents. There are plenty of brands or toiletry products. One single company, uh, Procter & Gamble, they provide plenty of products and different brands of a similar product range. Yeah? So these are the reasons why a new entrant finds it very hard to enter the market. I found it very interesting that Chinese, a lot of Chinese companies are very resilient. They penetrated this mobile phone business easily in the past 10 years. Now that you have Huawei, you have Redmi, you have all this Oppo, mostly Chinese brands, but they're just getting, gaining market share. 
while others are losing, actually. Yeah? That's very hard, but they are resilient. This, these firms are resilient. So how do we know whether there is a oligopoly or not in the market? You can calculate concentration ratios. You take uh, sales of, let's say, five firms and divide it by the whole industry sales. Five firm ratio, sales of the five firms divided by total sales in the industry, 99% of it is controlled by five firms. So for these five firms supply the 99% of the market with sugar. So there is kind of taken together, these five firms are making monopoly up. Tobacco firms, it looks like five firms controlled in 2004, 99% of tobacco market. And more competitive is the furniture, wholesale distribution, advertising is more competitive, fishing industries are more competitive apparently. Only, you know, five firms make up only 16% of the uh, market share or they just serve 16% of the market. The remaining 84% has been served by some other firms probably. Yeah? So this is not 15 firm, you can ignore it. 15 firm appears to be higher, so that gives you how competitive basically the industry is. You may, some of you not remember Nokia. You, know, you may as well if you had the old Nokia brick phones. 1985, Motorola was the dominant firm. I think Motorola still exists, but under a different name or brand. But Nokia has disappeared now. So Nokia was leading then. After t 20 years, Nokia in 2005 took leadership of the market. 2005 up to 2009, if I remember correctly, Nokia was the best-selling mobile phone. It, its branded mo mobile phones were best-selling. Motorola then you know, was second or third. I don't remember exactly, but it was losing market share. Today, you may not even see any of the two. Motorola probably exists, but then Nokia disappeared. Microsoft bought it because it was losing market share and, and people weren't buying any more Nokias because of Apple and Samsung. And Samsung wasn't, didn't even have, I think, mobile phone back in 1985. It was known for having a TV or appliances, right? The products. But now today you have this proliferation of brands, Apple, Samsung, Oppo, and all these things. So remaining as a leader in one market is not possible for oligopolistically competitive firms. They could remain for a long time as dominant firms only if they cooperate, like sugar market. And also, this sugar market is not easy to penetrate as well anyway. You need to build a huge infrastructure for sugar manufacturing. And a lot of licensing, I think, because of the uh, environmental impact of producing sugar. Now, let's look at the case of cartelization, cartels. This is just a group of gangsters, yeah? In Mexico, for example, or in, in, in other parts of the world, we have negative view of them. But cartels can be formed by anyone, even, in, uh, with, a, with, even with a good intentions as well. Now, let's look at duopoly. Duopoly is where two firms dominate the market. And you can think of Pepsi and Coca-Cola making up duopoly in some countries, but not in all. Because in this country, the duop Pepsi and Coca-Cola is not necessarily duopoly. There are plenty of other ranges here. But in some countries, there may be a duopoly. There aren't many brand brands and ranges for those countries. Yeah? Now, if they want to you know, cooperate, if Pepsi and Coca-Cola wants to cop cooperate and then decide on the mutual understanding, the quantity they produce and price they charge, then they are colluding. They are basically cheating. And the price fixing or quantity fixing is illegal. Collusion is illegal as a result. Yeah? But if they keep colluding, they form a cartel. And if government allows them to, con to do that, they form a cartel. And it's easy to bribe many governments and, and get away with this monopoly prices as well in some countries. So in effect, once the cartel is formed, it's a single company because decisions are made jointly. So it is a form of monopoly as a result. So oligopoly can become a monopoly as well if the number of firms are fewer in the market. Now these are the cases of cartelization in the market or collusion in the market. I will leave them to you. You can Google any of these and you, there are plenty of stories. But I'll just look at one case, LIBOR, which is the most recent case. Um, London interbank offer rate is a rate at which banks borrow or lend each other, or, or deal business with each other. Banks usually borrow from each other. Yeah? So it's not only that we customers borrow from banks, but bank, banks also borrow from each other. And, and they, they, they base the cost of loan on LIBOR. It's just like agreed average rate in the market. But it turns out banks are coll were colluding in the past. They were talking to each other as to how much to charge other banks. And they were setting by colluding the price at a high rate and benefiting from them. And government discovered it in the UK, and then I think they fined billions of pounds this 
colluding firms. It was a network of five, six firms, including, if I remember, HSBC. Equilibrium for an oligopoly. Now imagine that, well, BP and Shell, you know all these companies, yeah? British Petroleum, not anymore British Petroleum. This is actually beyond petroleum now. They went into green energy. And Shell are duopoly in some countries. In some countries, that's the case. In some countries, you don't have many other firms. Maybe today, you have some other firms providing, supplying oil, but in some countries, BP and Shell are dominant, and they are the oligopoly. So they refine crude oil, and they may collude, if they would like to, to keep the oil prices lower by producing more. Or they could increase the oil price in the world by producing less. So they could, they could cooperate, or they could also pursue their own self-interest. They produce, without agreement, any amount they want. But it turns out the best outcome or best approach they could take is cooperation because they only have there are only two firms it's easy then to cooperate and keep the prices higher by colluding right so we will then look at the case where uh, they may not collude but then they achieve some sort of equilibrium level now did you read the news have you read the news I should say yesterday today Saudi Arabia is flooding the market with crude oil to affect the Russian economy because Russia is reliant on oil but Saudi is I also rely on oil, but Saudis usually um, would have large reserves of cash piled up in their banks and they could throw on. Yeah, exactly, this is the case. But in this case, Saudis, I think with their corporate, cooperating Middle Eastern countries, what these countries are, Oman, um, I don't know if uh, BAA does it, but Oman and some other Middle Eastern countries that supply oil would usually collude with Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, they would usually collude with this, uh, to what you call this, Saudis. But Russia is a competitor for them. So by colluding and producing more oil, they are reducing the oil price to, to, to affect the Russian economy. Perhaps it's because of, if you are interested in political economy, it's because of Syria, I think, Russia's role in Syria. Right, so there is a Nash equilibrium, so-called Nash equilibrium in oligopolistic market. Let's look at this now. This is the let's say this is the quantity in liters of oil. So when zero amount is produced, the price is 120. 120 times zero is the total revenue zero. Or think of this as a profit as well, assuming that marginal cost is zero. So this is also the profit. And if you uh, read this column, you see that 30 liters produced. The price is 90 euros. The, the product of the two is 2700. 20, but as we produce more and more, what happens is that the prices are going down. And it turns out if these two firms, BP and Shell, would like to maximize their profit, they should produce at this point 60 liters and sell 60 at 60 pounds each. And that would be the maximum pro profit they would make. So th 3600, let's say. But if they keep competing with each other, they may drive down, down the prices to zero, almost zero. This is not exactly zero, almost zero. You could produce a huge amount of oil, and in, a lot of oil in the market means prices go down eventually, right? And they could simply produce 120 liters and sell them at almost zero costs, earning a little profit. However, they could cooperate and stay here. If they collude, they could stay here. So if Saudis and Russians collude, Saudis cut back the product output and then they could increase the profit, raise the prices and increase profit. However, if each of these dominant firms, BP and Shell or Russia or Saudis, pursue their self-interest, they might end up somewhere between the two cases, profit maximizing case or perfect competition case. In perfect, this is a perfect competition case where the prices usually decline because firms try to sell as much as they can um, given the prices. So it could be, so the Nash equilibrium is outcome in the market as a result of firms pursuing their self-interest. Eventually they come, to a, uh, they come to a point, everyone is happy with it. Basically, they take into account others' reactions, of course. They also uh, work out uh, strategies that considers the uh, other competitors' strategies as well. So the oligopolistic outcome or equilibrium outcome would apparently lead, uh, lead us to this point. Not the highest price, 
or the, not the prof highest profit, but not the lowest profit. It's somewhere between the two. That's the Nash equilibrium. This can be achieved, this black highlighted uh, row can be achieved only if they collude, only they become monopoly. But they could go down to here as well if they compete. So monopoly and perfect competition is the two extreme cases, and they could settle somewhere between the two. Now, oligopolistic companies are usually cartelized, but if they are not cartelized, what happens is that everyone pursues their own interest in the market. And as a result, given the profit opportunities, new entrants into the market, and eventually the profits are competed away. Everyone basically pursues their self-interest. Then cartel breaks down. The only way they can maintain the oligopoly is by looking at the, what others are doing, looking at the other strategies, and based on that, making the decisions. That could lead them to what you call Nash equilibrium. So that's the idea here. However, how do they decide what to produce and what price to charge is based on whether the output or price effects are balanced. Output effect is a case where firm produces more because their price is still higher than the marginal cost of the product. Then they produce more. They tend to produce more because they think, okay, we still have more profit opportunities, so why not to produce more? But price effect is a case where there are plenty of competitors. And this is the case where the higher production leads to lower prices. In this case, it's usually oligopolists don't want to produce more because it leads to lower prices. So the optimal outcome for the two firms, BP and oil or Saudis or Russians, is when the, these two marginal effects balance out. Output effect equals the price effect. That will be the optimal case for the firms.